Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag, where I just open my mail. Why? I don't know. Everyone seems to love it. This one comes from Lawrence Bilson. He's from uh, Maylands in WA, Western Australia. If you don't know what uh, parcel post looks like, open whenever. So here we go. Got one from Australia. No worries. Let's have a look. See what Lawrence has sent. It's sort of like big and heavy, so let's have a squeeze. We have a note. Oh, oh we've got a couch. Look at this. Look at this. What is it? Research Electronics Inc. Hmm. Nice bag. Wow. Got some <laughs> training tape. A cassette tape. For you youngsters out there, look at this. Cassette tape. Look, it's a real live cassette tape. Oh, fantastic. Smells, you know, maybe uh, late 80s, vintage, early 90s perhaps. Let's have a look. Research Electronic Ink Owner's Guide. Oh, wow, what is this? Check it out. Some sort of audio surveillance uh, device, kind of like what you know, like what uh, ASIO would use or something like that for um, audio monitor probe. Ooh, some sort of secret squirrel stuff, perhaps. This could be fascinating. There's a. I like the look of this. It's some sort of probe. Let's read the note. Hi Dave, here's a genuine piece of Cold War spy technology, yeah, for your teardown repair. It was found out in the back of a very deep dark cupboard while working at a previous employer. Hmm, I guess who shall remain nameless. My grand plan was to take it home and fix it. We're not supposed to solder at our office desks, yeah, bloody OH&S and all that sort of crap. But yeah, we pretty much ignored that at every company I've ever worked at, even though it was company policy. Um, the fumes may cause some sort of chronic health problems according to the health and safety jerk who was smoking cigarettes as he told him this. Love it. Uh, he since changed jobs, company doesn't really exist anymore and the thing's been gathering dust in um, his shed for years. So, wow. This has got to be a separate video. There's no way I'm going to do this sucker justice. It's got some uh, remote... Um, oh, it's made in the United States of America. USA, USA. Great. It kind of like rattles a bit. But anyway, specialised bit of kit for Cold War era. So, yeah, I was probably right on the smell. It might have been the 80s or uh, or something like that. It doesn't look like late 70s. It looks like definitely 80s uh, tech. 88. There you go. <laughs> My smell's pretty bang on. Um, 1988, Rev 1. Um, whether or not it was manufactured in 88, I don't know. It's not very secret when it comes with a manual that's not classified or anything. Anyway, it doesn't do anything fancy. It's just like for audio monitoring and things like that. But maybe we can give it a burl. Awesome. Thanks, Lawrence. So what we have here is a CPM 700. And this is what's known as a counter surveillance probe. What counter surveillance means is pretty much um, exactly as it sounds. It's to counter any surveillance, i.e. bugs. It's a bug sweeper. That's exactly what this thing is. It's an RF bug sweeper anywhere from um, a few hundred kilohertz up to two gig. And hence why it comes with this funky little um, probe. I thought this was like a, a like some sort of near field thing, but no, obviously. Ta-da! There we go. It's an antenna that you can go and probe around. I'm not sure like how like uh, close it's like supposed to be if you can actually get like near things and and stuff like that. I'm not sure. Anyway, there's a test uh, transmitter with it off and on. And we've got this audio cassette tape. I love this. Demonstration cassette accompanies the owner's manual. Contains training examples. Do not play this cassette in any area which may be a target for eavesdroppers. It will disclose your intentions. Go to a low security area and read the owner's manual. So there you go. This is straight out of the 1980s. Basically just, uh, you know, right at the tail end of the uh, 
uh, Cold War, and I'm not sure if this was publicly uh, available or not, but uh, yeah, specifically designed for counter surveillance. Woohoo! Awesome! And it also comes with um, not just RF, uh, like radiated emissions with the RF uh, probe here, but also uh, uh, conducted ones as well. We've got this, um, this is a 240 volt version, Australian plug of course, designed to plug in, and it's also got a carrier current transmitter as well, designed for sweep to sweep for bugs that actually plug into the mains, because you know, a spy from ASIO here in Australia, that's our uh, spy, it's our not so secret spy agency here, they might, you know, if they want to bug a place, they, w they might come along and just plug in a tiny little mains adapter, like it might be disguised as a USB adapter, for example, and I think, uh, like a USB charger, and I think, if memory serves me correctly, in the Edward uh, Snowden uh, documents actually released, that um, they, they show that the NSA had uh, some things like this, you just plug them into the main, so they might come along and, you know, replace a USB charger with another one that actually has uh, a microphone built into it, and then that would uh, transmit that on a carrier at a higher frequency and use the mains as an antenna so they can listen to it, you know, next door or something like that. So, yeah, that's, um, or in the van parked outside, Whoa. so there you go, this is, uh, made in the US, um, Cookville, TN, Tennessee, I believe that is, and uh, it's, it's going to be a real interesting bit of kit. It is battery powered, so uh, apparently it's got some uh, double A's or uh, something in there, but uh, there you go. I'm sure it takes some skill to actually use these and uh, sweep for bugs. You know, you have to be properly uh, trained to do this sort of thing, but you know, too bad if you're above, <laughs> if you're looking for stuff above two gig, this one's not going to cut it, but hey, that was, that was the duck's guts back in the late 80s anyway. Was anyone using, like, you know, we take like 2.4 gig, you know, or wireless stuff these days for granted, but, well, you know, how many, how much stuff was working on that sort of, you know, beyond two gig back then? Oh, and by the way, it can sweep for uh, phone line bugs as well, although we don't have the uh, phone line adapter here, but here's some uh, basic specs, 50 kilohertz to two gig, um, there we go, oh, no, um, it goes up to three gig at minus uh, 10 dB. There you go. So um, VLF uh, probe up to uh, one megahertz down to 15 kilohertz. It's got audio amp and display. So it basically just allows you to sweep across and establishing a game plan. Time of entry, setting up the eavesdropper. Woo, sweep considerations. This is interesting stuff. Interesting bedtime reading. How to uh, do counter surveillance. Terrific. But basically, I think uh, this sort of stuff is only going to work on like analog uh, transmitters, of course, you know, because what it, what the basic um, operation is, is you have a known sound source. So you're generating like a one tiller kilohertz tone in the room, for example. And of course, you're sweeping for audio bugs. So you're, if there is a bug in the room, it's going to be transmitting that one kilohertz signal modulated on a higher carrier, you know, it might be 800 megahertz or uh, something like that. So it sweeps through, so you sweep through the entire range looking for that particular known um, sound uh, source. And that's basically how you, uh, uh, you know, analog sweep a room like this. I mean, if, of course, if the audio is, you know, digitally uh, compressed, encrypted, encoded, then, well, you know, it's it's much harder. You have to sweep for just general uh, transmitters. But stuff for, like, you know, analog uh, type stuff, you know, back in the day, that was probably rudimentary uh, type thing, especially in something so small. I mean, electronics, you know, if you're trying to hide a bug inside a, a power adapter, there's a fair bit of room inside there, for example, but, you know, like if you want a smaller one, like you might conceal it behind the PowerPoint or in some other item or something like that, they're generally, generally going to be very small, so they're generally going to be, uh, you know, real simple, uh, you know, not very complex technically uh, devices. So, you know, they might use an analog uh, technique, for example, they just remodulate the audio from a microphone, transmit it at a higher frequency, and Bob's your uncle. And something like this could really easily detect that. I love this. Serendipitous use of this device or application for the purposes of surveillance is a violation of federal statutes. Good thing I'm not an American.
So I'll save that for a separate Teardown Tuesday, although I suspect there's not a huge amount of uh, stuff in here. It's going to be fairly uh, simplistic. It's not doing like any digital uh, processing or anything like that. It'll probably just be an entirely um, analog uh, type unit, real old school from the 80s. But uh, it'll be fascinating to actually attempt to get it uh, going and maybe uh, sweep for a dummy bug in the room or something. That'd be very cool. Thanks, Lawrence. Next up, time sensitive one, Kickstarter uh, open ends the 8th of uh, the 15th. Please excuse the huge bag, I had to keep it out of the sorting machine. <laughs> there you go. Yes, because if it's small enough, it will go through the manu uh, the uh, automated sorting machines and it can bend and uh, break them. So this one's from um, Spain. So hi to all my Spanish viewers. Awesome. We rarely get one from Spain, so let's crack it open. It's. Uh, Obviously a Kickstarter. We like looking at uh, people's Kickstarters here. It's teeny tot. It's teeny tot. Is it? Hatta Logico prototype. It's a Jelby? Huh? No idea what it is or does yet. Let's read the note. Aha! It's a Raspberry Pi hat. Stupid name. I'm sorry. It just is stupid. Anyway, um, it's basically a um, I squared C IO uh, expander board to give some more useful functionality to the Raspberry Pi. Yes, I do like this kind of stuff. Um, uh, it contains one uh, PCA 9685, 16 channels of 12-bit PWM. Very nice. Um, one ADS1015. Uh, which is an 8-channel 12-bit ADC. It's got a uh, microchip MCP4725. That's uh, got two channels of 12-bit DAC. And it's got some uh, level-shifting stuff as well. Also, it's got an E squared prom and, uh, and two I squared C bus extenders. Awesome. Excellent. There you go. Thank you very much, John Lumley. And I'll post a link to the Kickstarter down below if you want to check it out. So as I said, it is a hat for the Raspberry Pi to do all sorts of multi-channel uh, goodness. 12-bit PWM, 12-bit ADC, 12-bit DAC, and uh, some level shifting of SPI and serial stuff as well. And, well, it looks to do just that. He's got the requisite chips on there. No input uh, protection at all or anything like that that I can see. No output uh, buffers, but uh, it all, like for the DAC, for example, it all depends on what you use. No output uh, uh, driver uh, transistors for the PWM, uh, for example. So it's not a high power thing. It's basically a logic level, um, a low level uh, type thing. It's not like an industrial controller add-on board or anything. It's just for uh, experimenting in general. Um, hookup of uh, external signals there and that that looks all right nothing wrong with that at all it's got the cutout slot in there for the um, LCD connector which I'm uh, sorry the um, camera or whatever um, yeah the flat flex camera connector cable that goes in there and uh, seems to fit just nicely based on the uh, photos I don't have any uh, headers to actually uh, well I'm not going to go solder headers and plug it onto my Raspberry Pi and uh, try it out but there you go. If you're in the market for that sort of thing, go check it out. He's um, 22 days left as of recording this. He's up to 4,800, or well, he's after 4,800 pounds. I think he's up to 600 pounds or something like that. And all the uh, stuff is on GitHub as well, which I'll link in down below if you're a GitHubite and you want to check out the schematics. So presumably it's um, open source hardware, is it? He doesn't mention that, but it's on uh, GitHub, all the info. So presumably I don't see the open source hardware logo on there. Maybe it's like just public domain or something like that. Who knows? Anyway, thanks, John. Check it out. Next up, one from the US. And based on the description, I think we've had one of these before on the blog. I've done a teardown of one. So hopefully it's not the same one. You'll know it. Well, if I told you, you'd probably remember that video. Anyway, it was a really interesting device and uh, let's check it out it just it doesn't really say who it's from just the shipping manager I don't know anyway it's from Angus Angus Dorby g'day Angus um, enclosed is an AAD automatic activation device for parachutes that is out of service and not worth uh, to repair given the service time left it is a piece of safety critical life-saving equipment that senses pressure and electrically fires yes the pyrotechnic charge in it 
and yeah I've done a tear down of these before let's see if it's exactly the same one if it's a different one then we can certainly um, Cypress I, is that the one we tore down last time I can't remember I'll know it if I see it no no this is different this is different All pr awesome so this is a Cypress automatic um, it, it, it's very similar in fact that's that's practically an identical um, uh, charge device. This is the cord cutter. So you put your parachute for your reserve parachute through this hole. And, uh, and there's a little blade in there with a pyrotechnic uh, charge. And it, of course, just sends a voltage to it. Boom. Uh, uh, blast the charge. A little blade goes up. Cuts the, uh, the, the line that holds your uh, backup parachute um, in it. And it's got a... Uh, it will have... A replace after getting wet okay so if you land in the water oops you have to replace it and basically yeah it's just got an altimeter um, in it based on the atmospheric pressure and um, the idea is that if you're parachuting and you're unconscious or you're just busy admiring, admiring the view and you forget to pull your main chute once you get down to a certain preset level I think it's like um, 800 meters or something like that uh, from memory was was a typical uh, level it would automatically uh, think that you're unconscious and it'll automatically blow your reserve or your or is it your main chute um, I'm, and I think it could be the reserve chute anyway I'm not sure I'm not a uh, parachutist um, I'd rather be up flying the plane um, but yeah these are neat so another tear down we can compare it with the old one awesome actually come to think of it I'm pretty sure this is the brand that we had last time. It's just a newer unit. The old one was like real old school. It was all like through hole parts, if memory serves me correctly, and it was all potted with uh, some re enterable uh, potting gel. It was horrible. Um, but yeah, it, it looked uh, different to this. So this is probably a more modern one. Yeah, it was the, it was the Cypress one. I recognize the uh, LC, the little mini. Oh, oh. It's flashing. So I guess Angus hasn't seen my previous teardown of a Cypress uh, unit. So I wonder if um, this one, it'll be actually be interesting to tear this uh, down to see the differences. Anyway, for those who haven't seen the video, I'll have to link it in. We've got a connector here, which is, uh, is it? Or it was or something? No, that's no. no. I thought that was a connector. Maybe it screws in and out. Anyway, this connects to the uh, parachute cord cutter. There's a little pyrotechnic uh, charge in there. There's a little blade hidden inside there that goes whomp and cuts your parachute cord, which releases your uh, chute if you're uh, unconscious or just, uh, you know, having a bad day and you forget to pull the rip cord. And it's got a little um, LCD thing here. And there's, if I hold down, press it. I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember what it, um, how to operate the damn thing. Anyway, there's no risk of the thing going off. It's um, got uh, lithium primary uh, batteries in here. They're not designed to be uh, rechargeable. They're designed for basically, um, uh, you know, a given uh, life span and uh, and you know, as soon as the batteries run out, you might be able to replace them or something. Anyway, it's going to have the uh, replace after wet. There we go. That's the uh, filter for the um, air pressure sensor so you don't want to get it wet i guess you get different uh, sensors and it absorbs the water but uh, yeah you don't want it to uh, clogging up it's made in germany it's 2008 model but uh, obviously the battery is still doing something they last forever of course and yeah as i said no risk of this actually going off because these things are quite advanced and um, uh, well vetted of course you don't want these things going off accidentally and of course it has to fall at a known rate and like a change in air pressure a known rate so it has to detect that you're actually falling and things like that so you know i could play around with this until the cows come home and there's no way that's going to go off accidentally these things are too well uh designed and engineered for that but anyway um thanks angus it will be interesting to do another tear down tuesday on one of these see how it's evolved from the other model so hopefully it's upgraded because the other one was it was really old school like all through whole stuff and all potted in gunk it was ugh. next up one that weighs a bit it's from Carsten Bayer I believe how you pronounce it he's from uh, Maryland thank you very much Carson let's have a look and there we go let's have a look 
Weighs a fair bit. Warning. Warranty void if open. It's got a seal, like, and everything. Awesome. Oh, goodness. Oh, old school. Oh, well, oh, we've got a few things in here. An Aussie mail II net thing back in the day. Anyway, it's a Belkin gate. It's just, that's their brand. It's the Belkin gateway uh, router. And here's something I like the look of. Ha ha. Look at that. And a Zeus uh, netbook. It's even got the front facing camera. Whoa. -ha. Um, I have no idea what. Uh, what model it is for you Azus uh, fanboys out there. You no doubt uh, recognize that puppy, I'm sure. Um, what is it, like a, you know, an Intel Atom or uh, something like that, perhaps? Got some sort of weird dog taggy remote control thing. Oh, more memory, more memory. A packet of chips. A packet of chips unsalted. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we've got various memory. Jeez, it's a whole bunch of PC stuff. What an Apple connector. We've got a Nokia phone. I've got tons of phones for teardowns. I'm going to have to do a whole bunch of them. And we have a Sony Cybershot 8 megapixel camera. It's the DSCW100. Did anyone have one of those puppies? Pretty bulky, but uh, once again, might make an interesting teardown. I wonder if that works. Is that a double A? No, it's just, yeah, it's got a battery in it. I wonder if it works. Nah, dead as a dodo. Hang on. This cable looks like an Apple connector, but it's not. It's some weird ass proprietary Zeus thing, which then goes into a USB connector, presumably for charging because it's not a female one. And that's the only way to charge this now piece of shit. Because it's got a proprietary charging connector. There's no DC jack, one of the duck's guts, but that's just evil. Unbelievable. It's still got enough thickness to whack a USB connector in there for charging. A standard USB port. Unbelievable. Now, uh, hang on a second. Hang on a second. People are probably already screaming at, uh, yep, yeah, people are screaming at me. Watch this. Ah, it's one of these um, transformer tablet things. Oh, so it's a, a an Android um, tablet, hence the, you know, it's got a camera on the back, camera on the front, use it as a regular tablet, and then this is just the keyboard plug-in. It's still evil that they use this bloody proprietary it looks like an Apple connector, but it wouldn't be, right? And, it, yeah, this is the keyboard docking, but unbelievable. Just have 5-volt USB to bloody charge the thing. That's just horrible. Absolutely horrible. Oh, complete and utter failure. And you know what else is a failure? The warranty void, if, um, <laughs> if opened, sticker. Well... I can open that without voiding the warranty. Mwah. Another camera or two. I've got heaps of phones. I've always been meaning to do like a maybe a retro um, tent, like phones over time or something like that. And uh, uh, Aussie Mail. Look at this thing. Jeez. It's a Belkin uh, router. We could do a two minute teardown on that. There we go. Belkin gateway router. Well, that was too easy. Didn't even need any screws. It just uh, lifted straight off. We've got ourselves a dual diversity uh, antenna on the back here. Going, whoop, going in there. There's our, um, there's our Wi-Fi right in there. We've got that as a separate, uh, separate module. Does that come out? Looks like it. No, oh, it's. I didn't see that. It's gunked down there. Oh. That's not fair. Anyway, I don't think there's anything terribly exciting. One major uh, custom ASIC under a heatsink here. Here's our modem interface down here. We've got our relays and we've got some optocoupler isolation, all that sort of goodness. What's that? A VoIP voice pump. Whoop, there it is. Voice pump chipset. <laughs> no idea who. Is that the name of the company? Voice pump? Yeah, possibly. Um, is that a voice over IP thing? Something like that? Anyway, um, this is about, oh, it looks like about 10 years old. 
or something like that. Can we get a date code? There you go, this uh, Ethernet chipset here, 05. So yeah, around about uh, 10 years old. There, doing the business here on the Nippon Chemicon. Main cap, the 2200 mic one there. That's not too shabby at all. Uh, top brand, of course, for those who don't know, Nippon Chemicon. Um, hello. 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 Look at that. <laughs> it's soldered that little... Is that a jumper? I can't read that. Yeah, that's a zero ohm jumper. Um, designed to have a big ass power resistor in there. Maybe some sort of current sense thing, perhaps. I don't know. But yeah, it just, oh, just whacked it in there at an angle to boot. Thank you very much. But of course, that angle is probably just due to like, you know, uneven uh, surface tension or something like that. When it uh, reflowed, it may have just, you know, pulled it at that angle. Pads clearly aren't designed for um, that little, um, you know, uh, 0805 part. So yeah, whoopsie. I don't think there's much more we can say about that. It's a 10 year old router modem -y thing. Mm. He's sending this Think Geek Annoyatron. What the hell is an Annoyatron? Let's have a look. And a big ass buzzer on there. Little, hey, single sided uh, phenolic base. There we go. Single sided phenolic base uh, board. And there's a battery, and, um, oh, I know what these things are. Right, you're supposed to, yep. Yep. Okay, yeah, I think these are designed, like, you hide them, like, in an office somewhere, and it beeps, like, just at a random time period, and just annoys the hell out of people. So, I'm sure maybe there's different modes or something like that, but, yeah. <laughs> Goodness sake. Ah, practical, office practical jokes for the win. And we can change the sound that it uh, beeps. And of course it's got a magnet on it. So you can just, you know, go to the bench at work and just, you know, whack it behind there. And ah, yeah, no worries. Hours of fun. And this apparently is a cheap-ass eBay Bluetooth headphone adapter thing. Got to be a two-minute teardown. Not going to be too hard to rip that open. Okay, we've got ourselves a... One hung, genuine one hung low lithium rechargeable in there. Let's have a look. Yeah, wouldn't trust that any further than I can throw it. And uh, we've got ourselves one little uh, QFN package. Very small uh, pitch on that. Jeez, what is that? Like 0.4 millimeter pitch QFN? Oh, evil. And that is a CSI brand, never heard of them, 57F687, A05U. Yeah, it's like, maybe, I don't know, is it a big brand? Is it one of those um, more generic, um, you know, uh, Chinese uh, supplier brands or what? I don't, yeah, no idea. And it's a bag of unsolded chips, as he calls them. These are... Uh, Old school, what do we got? PC 133s, uh, 256 meg, oh wow. Can you even give these things away these days? Well, apparently you can give them away to me. Awesome, old school PC stuff. But you gotta remember, these things like cost a fortune back in the day and now it's like, well, who wants, you know, 256 meg stick? I mean, yeah, nobody. So yes, here's this a Zeus Transformer, very nice. Um, maybe we can uh, possibly do a uh, teardown of it and, well, I'm gonna have to, look, it just, it's a docking, oh, docking station and uh, the tablet just comes off like that. Nice, let's see if we can power it up. Now it did need a charge and it didn't seem to charge through the keyboard, but I plugged the cable uh, directly into here. You can plug that USB charging cable either directly into the tablet or into um, the side of the thing here. There we go. So I guess that's the method in their madness is that, well, you can use the same cable to charge either, but like they could have done a dual power system with the USB. This thing does have a little USB port on the side there, this keyboard. Anyway, apparently I believe this has like an extra uh, battery in it so you can get like up to 15 hours use or something if you uh, combine them. So you charge up this battery, you use it as like a, a charging bank and or a keyboard. Anyway, I've powered the thing up and um, 
Yep, sure enough, it's uh, powered by NVIDIA Tegra, and it seems to work. The device is unlocked, but it gets no further than that, so it is well and truly bricked. Hello, I can see myself. Hey, that's one of the horrible things about, um, you know, looking at uh, <laughs> things with screens like this on the camera. It's just a reflection. You see my LED studio lights up there, and ah, uh, they're just, you know, it's just horrible to, horrible to be able to review these things, just getting light right on screen on you know really reflective uh, screens like that is really annoying anyway thank you very much uh, for all this stuff Carsten. i'm going to uh, try and unbrick this thing definitely um and maybe we can do a uh, tear down of it are they easy to open i don't know if anyone can share any advice on that whether or not otherwise um yeah like it could be a great little um sagan um you know car tablet he loves watching well everything because you know he's like four Next up, one from Sweden. Hi to all my Swedish viewers. Um, from somebody who I guess wants to remain anonymous. Jeez, how do I open this one? It's looking a bit, looking a bit tricky. Let's. Huh. Interesting case. Uh, here we go. Hey. What is it? Looks like some sort of PLC thingamabob. No idea. No note? Thank you very much. Just got old electronics on it. A Westermo. That's the company made in Sweden. Westermo. I don't know what it is, but yeah, it looks like some sort of uh, industrial controller. Need to look it up. Thanks. Maybe a mini teardown. So let's do a quick two minute teardown on this thing, a TD32EU from uh, Westermo, and uh, hello, <laughs> there we go, mini teardown, <laughs> no I'll take take it a bit further than that, so it looks like it's got some uh, um, RS, it's an RS232 v, V24 thing for uh, yeah, lease lines and stuff like that, so yeah, let's have a quick look. Thankfully, these things are designed to come apart. No screws. The end just uh, clipped off. Oh, <laughs> there's a there's the note. Ah, uh, Anders was playing sneaky buggers with us. All right, Dave, this is a small mail sent from Sweden. It's the 31st of March. Outside it's sunny, but only about three degrees C. It never gets three degrees C here in Sydney. Jeez, even uh, as we well, we're not winter time yet, but uh, it's getting a little bit chilly here. I think it was like. You know, 16 degrees today or something like that. Anyway, this is a leftover industry modem for a two-minute teardown. It was fully functioning uh, the day it was taken out of service. It would carry on for... Yeah, I think it would carry on forever. These things generally do. Not much that can go wrong in them. Um, how can a hobbyist test their DMMs? Bonus question. Um, well, you can get a uh, voltage reference. It depends on what class uh, DMM you've got. If you've... Like on eBay, you can buy voltage. Uh, uh, like for, I think they're very cheap, even for like twenty bucks or something from China. You can get like a uh, an accurate uh, or reasonably accurate, you know, like 0.05 percent, like nominal, you know, uh, ten volt voltage reference. And it might have a voltage divider. Uh, for example, the DMM check is another one. Um, I think the guy is shut down. He's not making those anymore. Anyway, there's quite a few on there and it's very easy to buy a, uh, you know, a precision, you know, 0.01% resistor from DigiKey or something like that for a few bucks. And uh, with those two, a voltage reference and a precision resistor, you can generate current as well. Um, testing AC is a little bit uh, harder, but um, anyway, there's no reason why you can't uh, test your multimeter on the cheap. Anyway, the best advice for doing multimeters, this is why I advise having two multimeters, is because if you've got two, you can always compare them against each other, against basically anything on all the ranges. Doesn't matter what it is, doesn't have to be an accurate device, accurate voltage or accurate resistance. Test the two meters when you get them, and if they don't, and if they still read the same in like every time you test them, then you can pretty pretty confident that neither of those meters has drifted at all. And they're going to be, you know, fairly good confidence that we're they're within spec, especially if you spot check them with 
one of those voltage references, for example. So anyway, I didn't read the rest. I just waffled on there. Um, he's got an old Fluke 73. And how do I need to, you know, need to know it's somewhat accurate? Well, the Fluke, the 73s, they're pretty darn reliable. My, I pretty much bet my bottom dollar it's going to be accurate to almost to the least significant uh, digit bang on. They usually are. They're pretty darn good. They, those things don't drift. But yeah, there's just so many voltage reference uh, chips available, 10 volt ones, just, you know, either you can buy it yourself or get samples, for example. A lot of manufacturers give away uh, samples of their voltage reference chips, so you can get one for Nix, or you can just go on eBay and, and just, or buy one in your next DigiKey order, or, or whatever, wherever you get your parts from, and it's going to be more than good enough for a Fluke 77, uh, a Fluke 70 series uh, DMM. So, there you go. Postage came in at, a, at 100 SEK. Um... Swedish uh, Kroner, isn't it? I believe um, about fifteen dollars Australian. <laughs> yeah, even you know sending something like that—that's not bad actually for sending this around the world. Anyway, thank you very much, Anders. And this is where he lives in comparison to Australia. I've never gotten that far before. I've gotten to Germany up there, but uh, yeah, haven't gotten across the pond there to uh, over to Sweden. Eh, one day, and there's a view from his office window and. Well, yeah, here's a view from my office window. That's it. Hmm. And these industrial modules are always very nice. Look at this. Board to board pin headers. They just come apart like that. And yeah, these are very nice. We got look at that. There's a Schaffner um, common mode choke there. What else have we got? We got some uh they look like uh, uh they're um uh, transformers, they're your line uh transformers. Got ourselves a buzzer built into it. Not sure why you need a buzzer in an industrial uh, type modem, but you get the modem sex sound, as it's called. I can't do it anyway. Some people can insert modem noises there. Non HRC uh, fuse, but a nice little um, uh, raised fuse holder there. Looks like we've got a uh, switch. Is that a switch in? Uh, custom little switching transformer, perhaps. Not sure what's going on there, but uh, yeah, these things designed and made to last, you know, pretty much forever uh, using the PCB as a heatsink. Got some spark gaps there. No, well, a spark gap. Um, so, yeah, very nice. And I love how they've used a, uh, looks like a press rivet there. And, uh, yeah, there we go. They've used a rivet to uh, hold that in instead of a screw. Eh, it's easier. Save, you know, um, a couple of seconds of operator time and uh, connectant, I think. Yep, connectant. No real surprises for those who are familiar with those things. But what is this? Why do we have a chip with a board over the top? Is that some sort of shield? It's got to be. One interesting little observation. They've glued down these little ferrite chokes here. Look at that to stop them flapping in the breeze, to stop them spinning on there, because normally they're just loosey goosey inside there and uh, just stop them rattling around. And that's, um, looks like that's clearly done after they're installed, I think. So, yeah, nice touch. There's a reason that they've done that. They don't want uh, vi vibration or anything that this uh, rack or something is, is connected to. I don't know, but. Yeah, nice touch. And I love sucking off a component. I just got the solder sucker out there, and uh, let's have a look. Oh, look at that. Uh, I haven't lifted it off yet, but yeah, the solder sucker did its job. There's like no residual anything in there, and ta-da! What do we have? It's another connectant device. Um, that's the, That's got to be the main uh, modem chip, I would presume. But uh, yeah, so that has to be a... Uh, that has to be a shield. I mean, you know, that's, yeah, I mean, that's just copper on the back there. So, like, that's all it's doing. Maybe to pass some, um, you know, some sort of uh, EMC requirement, perhaps. And old school external Atmel program ROM. Love it. So thank you very much, Anders. These are always rather interesting. Take a look in these sort of industrial controllers. And as you said, yeah, probably lasts forever. Next up, one from Cody Wilson. Name kind of rings a bell. A second suck of the sav on mailbag, perhaps. Anyway, he's from Sparta. Love the name. Um, this, uh, that's the town Sparta in MO. Um, Missouri, I think. 
MO is Missouri, is it? I think so. Hopefully that's, yeah, let's have a look. There's a, some sort of hockey thing. Not really into hockey. Sorry to all you Canadians. Oh, these are, uh, oh, wow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Check these out. These are ugh, lead bulbs, but they are, check it out, wait, wait for the focus, wait for the focus, and they're burnt out. Whoa, dude. And look at these sad excuses for lead bulbs. I'll show you closer up in a second with the macro lens, but here we go. This is a 12 volt uh, lead. It's cooked, obviously, used about two weeks, an average of eight hours a day. And oh, I wish this was smell o vision or probably, you should be glad it's not smell o vision because this stuff smells awful. So there we go, we've got a full wave uh, bridge rectifier there, designed for DC so you can hook these things up either way, but they've clearly not designed them well enough. I mean, like, they're just absolutely cooked. Unbelievable. Look at this, it's just disgusting. 93.1 ohms a pop, but, oh, look at that. Wow, just lifted off like that. Unbelievable. They just, what, it didn't, are the resistors dissipating too much power? So it's interesting that it's burnt right down the middle of the board near those resistors. So are the resistors overheating? But I think it's going to be like a combination of these. They've got two big strips of LEDs in there like that, which have, um, these are three uh, chip ones, by the way. Like they're going to be three in parallel. You can tell because these are six pin uh, J lead packages. So, um, yeah, it looks like it's a combination of both and they're just heating up right under there. But they're obviously heating up really, really bad. But these are 91 ohms a pop. And a rough mental calculation tells me that these are actually probably, to, uh, they're running these to spec. I don't think they're over-specking them. To Dave Cad we go. And how many of those LEDs have we got in series? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven resistors here. And if you count the LEDs on top, there's 21. So it looks like they're going to have, without following the actual uh, PCB pattern, it uh, goes to um, show that there's going to be three in series. And as I said, there's going to be three in parallel inside each one. So it's technically uh, nine uh, LEDs with each um, uh, you know, string, because look, you can see the trace snaking its way through there like that. So that's the common, which is, yep, coming from our full wave diode bridge here. So a quick calculation of what we're going to get here. Um, nominal 12 volts DC input. We've got a full wave ridge rectifier. So that's going to be uh, two diodes in series, regardless of the orientation, uh, you, you, the polarity of the input. Um, so I'm going to take a nominal 0.6 uh, volts each for those. We can uh, actually measure that if we want. Um, we've got 91 ohm series uh, dropper resistor here and a nominal because these are white LEDs and they're going to be a nominal 3 volts. So if we put in these nominal figures, figure out what sort of current this thing's running at. So it's going to be 10.8 uh, volts here after your diode drops. Um, you subtract the 9 volts uh, total divided by 91 ohms. We're working around about 20 milliamps and that seems my... Um, uh, hunch was right. That seems a bit low, less than the maximum. I'm going to see if I can find a data sheet for these things. Now, I can't be sure of the exact data sheet, but I pulled this one off DigiKey, and it looks to be um, pretty much exactly uh, what we've got here. So it's going to be close enough. We can use this as a uh, ballpark indication. There we go. As I said before, they've got um, uh, three in uh, basically going out to separate pins, but on this uh, board here, they've actually uh, joined all the pins, shorted all the pins together on either side. So they're putting three LEDs in parallel. And these are nominally 60 milliamps. Look at that. So yeah, way underrated. That's why, you know, I think running these things at 20 milliamps is, is not stressing these things at all. 
And if we have a look at the forward current versus voltage graph, then we can see that at 20 milliamps, we're running at about, well, well, it's according to this particular brand LED anyway, the other one should, might be uh, fairly close, at uh, 2.9 volts, so it's close to that nominal 3 volts. So yeah, at these sort of low currents, I think the voltage drop isn't going to be quite uh, 3 volts, so I'm going to... Um, redo this equation with uh, 2.9 volts and we get around 23 milliamps and it doesn't matter it's still around the ballpark i think we should probably do some measurements and cody has sent in one that uh is still in good nick and has all the leads uh running there we go pairing it from uh 12 volts and it's uh drawing about 153 milliamps total uh 1.8 watts i'm not sure what these things are uh rated at in terms of uh wattage uh for example but you know being ebay it's going to be a load of crap. Anyway, let's um, measure the voltage drop across our resistor here. Ah, bingo, there we go, uh, 2.02 volts. And you divide that by 91 ohms and you get around about, there we go, 22.2 milliamps confirmed running through these strings. So they're definitely not overstressing these things at all. So why have they failed? If you do some calculations of what power we're dissipating here, as you uh, suspect from the current, it's not a huge amount. Like the power in each LED, for example, at uh, a normal, you know, that 22 milliamps is only about 64 milliwatts. And of course, uh, LEDs aren't hugely efficient, you know, a few tens of uh, percent, uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, they're going to be dissipating a lot of power as, um, well, that, that's the power that they're uh, consuming, not the power that they're dissipating. But, um, you know, it's going to be uh, reasonably the majority of the percentage of that um, due to the uh, low lead uh, efficiency. Let's not, you know, get into the different difference between efficiency and efficacy and all that sort of jazz in this video. Anyway, um, and the power dissipated in the resistor, 48 milliwatts. And that doesn't sound like much. It sounds like bugger all, but you've got to remember, these are small packages. 0805s, they've only got like a nominal power dissipation of like 125 milliwatts maximum, but they actually, but that's at a very high temperature, like 70 degrees C usually. So they, you know, so the resistor is going to uh, rise in temperature by, you know, I don't know, 30 degrees above ambient or something like that, maybe, or 20 degrees above ambient. And the um, LEDs, of course, each one of them. And then you've got them all, well, sorry, I'll disconnect that. You've got them all tightly uh, packed in there like that. And and also, there's hardly any copper on this board used as heatsink. This is not like an aluminium backed board. It's just poor thermal design in this thing. There's like, you know, sometimes you can get some of the heat out by uh, through the uh, pins. Of course, these things don't have uh, thermal. I don't think these have thermal pads on the back. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the only way to get the heat out is via, you know, is to have nice big uh, copper traces running to them. They've got tiny little piss in traces run into them so no wonder that they're going to heat up so uh, let's get the thermal camera out and see what it gets to but i think you'd be very surprised even though we're only talking about small amounts of power here i think you'd be very surprised that uh these are going to get quite hot so here you go i've had it on for about five minutes or so not very long you can see the uh heat pattern on the i just had it face down the leds um uh, face down pointing at the mat there um, there's not huge alignment on the uh, thing because it's too close on that MSX technology or whatever they call it. But uh, there we go. I mean, it is like 70, you know, I, I think I got it up to 72 degrees or something like that. And uh, yeah, it's the same on the top side. So, well, that's blinding me. Um, but yeah, it's like it's getting up to 70 degrees already. And remember, this is in free air and I do actually have the air con running in the room here at the moment so there is a you know a bit of a breeze blowing over it so you can see how this is going to get really hot in at one of those enclosed uh light fittings with no um you know ventilation at all basically um so yeah no wonder it's uh, you know you leave the thing on for eight hours a day for a long time and you know factor in that they probably use the cheapest fiberglass uh pcb uh, possible on this thing of course they're going to use the cheapest crappest uh, not high temperature uh, FR4 stuff really cheap nasty stuff they just it's just yeah even though they they're not overrating these things it's nothing to do 
with over overrating like you th thought it would be. They definitely, I think they're running these like under. Um, well, they could be different LEDs to what I got on the data sheet. They might be 20 milliamp maximum, and they could be operating at their maximum or something like that, perhaps. So they're definitely not running them over current. I mean, 20 milliamps is just fine. Any LED on the market is going to uh, is going to be at least rated for that. Uh, more likely, you know, 30 or 60 milliamps, as we saw from that data sheet. But it's just the piss poor thermal design of this thing, and probably um, uh, just a poor quality FR. Uh, for material, whatever uh, fiberglass board material they're using. So that's why these things eventually burn. Wah, fail. What do you expect from, you know, <laughs> cheap eBay stuff? And the other thing, of course, is that they have, uh, like, jam-packed all these things on here. So there's, you know, often not enough room to run big copper strips down the side like that to actually get heat sinking out of these things. So if they wanted this sort of density, they, um, you know, probably should have used uh, the proper ones with uh, thermal uh, pads on the back and, you know, aluminium uh, board to dissipate the heat on the back. That would have been, uh, you know, a proper thermal design for this thing. But now nah, they just cut corners, just whack the leads on there and, ah, she'll be right, no worries, mate. And, well, no fail after, you know, a few days' use. The things just heat up and, uh, and burn and get to a high temperature inside those no airflow uh, light fittings. Fail. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Cody, for sending those in. Next up, one from Jason Olefsky, something like that. He's from Rochester in New York. Hi to all my viewers in New York, and uh, it's a big place, New York. Been there, and let's have a look. What do we got? We got a postcard. <laughs> Eastman Kodak Company. Check it out. Look at that. Beautiful. And we have a note, but <laughs> a Novus. Here we go. We love vintage calculators here on EV blog. Um, yeah, oops. Um, it's a Novus 650. <laughs> Let's check it out. And here's this Nova 650 math box. It's a four banger. Look at this thing. It's got instructions on the back just in case you didn't know how to use a four banger calculator. And uh, yeah, it's a bit crusty. All those foams all deteriorate. And um, Jason has thoughtfully taken the screws out and makes your screen, skin crawl, doesn't it? Um, yeah, look, um, chip on board blob there and that's it. That's it. We've got ourselves a bubble display, which we've uh, seen before. Probably uh, National uh, Semiconductor back in the day. They were, uh, yeah, is that uh, any? Yeah, that's a National Semi mark, is it? Anyway, they made the, look, that's probably the smallest calculator board I've ever seen. There's one resistor in there, and that's, whoop, that strip's come off. Oh, yeah, look, I won't even bother. Actually, yeah, oh, no, no, because they're not wired. Those ones aren't wired into anywhere. Anyway, look, that is bugger all to it. Wow. That's it. A resistor and a chip. Thank you very much. Wow, it actually works. Check it out. Look, E, 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 E dot E. Ugh, that's, so we clear it. Ah, it works. Look. <laughs> Three, where's the decimal point? Where's the decimal point? What? What? Wow. Apparently, this is a fixed decimal point. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen a fixed decimal point. So look, there's no decimal point key. So if you wanted to do, you know, 3.14, you'd have to go 3, 1, 4. Whoop, whoa, hey, it's uh, running away there. Running away. 3, 1, 4, no. There's something, yep, yeah, strange going on there. Hmm. Anyway, uh, maybe it was, that was that cable. Anyway, you, it's a fixed decimal point. Unbelievable. What a heap of crap. Math box. It's made in America. Yeah, USA. So thank you very much, Jason, and it's old Chefsky. There you go. That's mailbag for another week. Thank you, everyone who's sent stuff in. Hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next time.